And what I want to do next is bring on our third speaker, and that is Roham. Roham is the CEO of Dapper Labs. You may know them from projects like CryptoKitties and NBA Top Shot. And we're going to talk about what the future of consumer looks like and how crypto fits into the game. So without further ado, please give Roham a big round of applause. Hey, everybody. In a lot of ways, I think... Um, you could think of my talk as the opposite of the talk that just happened, because I'm about to convince you guys that you can think way bigger than just crypto natives. But I actually agree with a lot of the same principles. Crypto native experience, crypto native benefits, and, um, and, and going to the place where the community lives. Um, but I'm going to try to convince you that there's a big world out there. I think I'm uniquely qualified, or at least I have a unique perspective on talking about consumer and the role of crypto, because I and some of the folks in this room have spent most of the last 10 years trying to build at this intersection. Um, we played around with Bitcoin back in 2014. That didn't really go, go anywhere, but we got really serious with Ethereum in 2017. Um, the author of ERC721, Dieter Shirley, is in the back of the, this room here. Uh, you'll be hearing from him uh, tomorrow, uh, so I won't dig into that. But we've built almost a dozen Web3 products over the last six years. And I want to talk to you about, about how we're doing with some of them and the lessons we learned along the way, but where I think the industry is going and why I'm so excited to continue building in this space for the next 10 years. Um, we created the first smart contract wallet um, on Ethereum for consumers, the first wallet that paid for gas on behalf of consumers, credit cards, key recovery, et cetera. Um, we built the first game on top of ERC721, but also brought some of the largest sort of licensed IPs to the blockchain with NBA, NFL, and Disney. Um, and here we are seven years later, and we're relaunching CryptoKitties at another uh, ETH global conference. The first one launched at ETH Waterloo back in, um, back in uh, 2017. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But first, even I haven't drunk the Kool-Aid enough to think that most people in the room, uh, outside of this room, would actually agree with this statement. I think most people outside of this room would disagree with this statement that the future of consumer uh, is crypto. I think people would agree with that the future of consumer is creator-driven. People might agree the future of consumer is driven by IPs. The future of consumer certainly involves generative AI. The future consumer involves spending more and more time, more and more of our money in games and digital worlds. Um, and the future of consumer might be an involved mixed reality. But the reason I get really excited about the work we do here every day is everyone would agree with this statement, that life is going to be increasingly digital. And when you talk to these same people that kind of talk about NFTs as dead or talk about crypto as only being for speculative use cases, you talk about, well, what do creators need in the next 10 years? How do they want to, how can they own their own communities? How can they monetize and manage them in new ways? What problems does generative AI introduce in terms of authenticity, provenance, and when the cost of creation is reduced to zero, how do you capitalize on top of that? When you talk about gaming and digital worlds, we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars on these digital assets. Uh, but gamers are starting to think about, well, what happens when the game changes? What happens when my asset goes away? So the other uh, alternative topic or, or title I had for this talk was NFTs are dead, long live NFTs. Because our thesis is that the future of consumer is crypto, but on the, in the background, providing those crypto native benefits, but in language that the consumers understand and in benefits that they value, not in terms of talking about the technology. And we think we've built some of that um, throughout the past six years, and I want to talk you through it. A couple of months ago, I went to the biggest Disney conference, the biggest Disney fan conference, and this was truly an incredible experience because you had 80,000 people from uh, across the Disney fan base. These are sort of super fans. They're people that travel to Anaheim to come to meet with licensees like us, people providing Disney branded products and services. And so it's really cool because you get to actually sit down and talk with your super fans, um, the people that actually believe enough in a given product to stand in line the whole day just to get access to a promotional item. And for me, it was an instructive experience because I spent the first few days, people would get up to the uh, booth, 
you know, they would see the, the advertisements, the videos would look pretty cool, and they would kind of be disappointed. Some of them would be disappointed when they realize it's digital. They'd say, oh, it's digital. Like, what, what, what is that? Why is it a digital pin? What, what do we want to do with it? And by the end of that weekend, those same people were showing me um, their full completed sets on their Disney Pinnacle apps. They had traded with folks on Discord because there's no uh, marketplace in the app still. Um, and, and they didn't think of the product as, hey, a way to make money, because again, there's no financial element. They thought of it as a way to do the thing they love doing, which is collecting pins in the physical world. Our booth was right across from the physical uh, pins booth, which was the biggest in the whole conference. Um, but in a way that gave them speed, they could do it in instantly, they could rip as many packs as they wanted to, gave them convenience, they could trade back when they were at a the hotel, they had full transparency, um, and, and it started to feel pretty cool by the end of it, even though in the beginning they were sort of taken aback. And, and these are the terms that we try to talk about when we talk to our users, um, and, and, and avoid talking about any aspect of the technology. The other thing I want to touch on that we're jumping into uh, in Adapter, and what I think opens up an incredible amount of opportunity for the folks in this room, is what's happening today on Telegram. And Telegram isn't special because of how many users they have, although in crypto, th that's a, a, it was an incredible number. Telegram special is because it's a social application going through its phase of allowing open developer access into its user base. And so whether it's through invite systems, whether it's through incentivization, access to the wallet, and it's a little more flexible outside of the US, this phase only happens for a short period of time in every social network's journey. And crypto, for, for the first time, kind of has a native distribution platform today. You don't have to build on the Ton network to launch on Telegram. Um, and in fact, you'll see that we've built a cross-chain application that involves Ethereum, Flow, um, as well as the Telegram user base. So we saw a huge amount of interest and, and, and sort of momentum from consumers, principally outside of the US and Canada, um, on Telegram. And it kind of reminded us of early days of Facebook, where you had very simple things going incredibly viral incredibly quickly through you know, questionable mechanics sometimes, uh, but opened up an avenue of like, hey, this kind of product needs to exist. And so how can we lean in to do something really special with it? And so we bring back CryptoKitties, but in a, not in the way you think. We're bringing back CryptoKitties in a way that's cross-chain and also cross-application. We want to rethink the meaning of a Web3 product, not in the sense of, hey, we want to over-serve the crypto-native audience, but we want to bring the value of openness, composability, and have different uh, products interacting with the same digital assets, opening up the avenue for third parties to be able to build things for these same digital assets, and also taking into account the fact that there's two million kitties that live on Ethereum today. Um, and then, uh, and, and of course, this Telegram game is the first entryway into doing that. So we're onboarding tens of thousands of users. Today, it's sort of a very um, quiet launch so far. Um, but it's very exciting, and it's, and it's a product that you don't have to think about crypto but you're earning um, what might become tokens in the future, and it's a gateway into what does it mean to have a wallet, what does it mean to have a currency to spend on, what kinds of things can you spend on. And unlike an app store where you go use an application and you buy assets and they stay inside the game, they stay inside the, the, the app, here we're trying to give people assets, and those assets lead them into different uh, applications, different worlds. So very excited about that. So the other thing I want to talk about is what maybe all of you know us um, uh, about, which is sports. You know, a lot of you in this room probably know Dapper Labs through NBA Top Shot, through NFL All Day. And in a lot of ways, these are still our biggest products. And I deeply believe sports will be the vehicle that will onboard hundreds of millions of more people into crypto, whether through digital collecting, whether through gaming, gambling, uh, sports betting, the amount of energy and momentum in what's happening in the digital world around sports is, is absolutely incredible. And so if any of you are working on sports betting applications, we also want to want to talk to you. Um, but we are, we've, we've been lucky to have a deep partner in both the NBA and in the NFL. This is the NBA commissioner, Adam Silver, on stage with me, talking about his vision for NBA Top Shot and talking about how, you know, despite any sort of market momentum or shift in market momentum, they're deeply committed to seeing um, this, this uh, new category kind of bloom. And in particular, that it's not just about collecting. Yes, it's true, people have collected things since the dawn of time. People have collected digital assets, people have collected physical assets around sports since the dawn of sports. 
um, and have tried to collect digital assets um, since the beginning. And, and, and NBA Top Shot um, is the first way they've really been able to do that at scale. Uh, but it goes beyond collecting. And, and these digital assets, because they're open, because they're transparent, because they live on a, a network that the NBA doesn't actually need us to query or to, or to be confident that um, they can kind of read the data transparently, Digital assets can be that connective tissue, the fan currency, the gateway um, into uh, all kinds of different products and services around a unified fan experience. And what I mean by that is anything you do in the world of the NBA should get recognized and rewarded in NBA Top Shot. And the status and ownership and, access and, and value that you build within NBA Top Shot should get recognized and rewarded in the world of the NBA. We're putting our money where our mouth is this season. And it's taken a while to get the product ready to this point, but, but I think we're getting there. We, we will have full integration with the NBA app itself, and so such that every person that goes in to sign up for an NBA ID can also at the same time get their first digital asset, get their first digital wallet, rip a pack, and maybe in the future get more benefits directly from the NBA inside the NBA experience. I mean, the first version will make them go inside our product, um, and in the future, they will be able to do things inside the NBA app itself. The other thing we're doing is we noticed that the most exciting, rabid, viral, sort of authentic thing around, you know, other than talking about big sale prices, and we'll talk a little bit about that, was uh, people going to live games, people getting together to watch games and ripping packs together. And so we said, how do we lean into that game-going experience? Uh, because we're also seeing something else that people aren't talking about in this room. One of the biggest crypto, consumer crypto products ever today is actually Ticketmaster. The Fortune 500 company, Live Nation Ticketmaster, has a product where they give, have given out tens of millions of ticket stubs, digital ticket stubs, to people that buy digital tickets. And these are markers of identity and provenance that 10 years from now, people will look back and say, hey, my digital wallet, the first thing I had in there was a ticket to this concert, or the ticket to this NBA game, or a ticket to this NFL game. Uh, 13 million people have gone in to claim their, their products. And so Ticketmaster is actually a, the biggest product on Flow, the, the blockchain that Dapper originally created, but is now um, independent and led by uh, Dieter and team. Uh, but we saw people doing crazy things with, with, uh, with both Top Shot and All Day at all kinds of NBA and NFL games. We saw the excitement around Ticketmaster itself and how people are going in and collecting these ticket stubs, even though they don't have any sort of journey or utility beyond that today. And so we said, well, let's partner up. They're already building on Flow. We're building on Flow. The, the, the data is all open. And let's figure out how to reward people for going to live games, first starting with the NFL games that just happened two weeks ago and every single game for the next four weeks. People that digital, uh, physical ticket goers will be able to claim their first uh, NBA top show, an NFL all day pack. And that pack will have a moment from the game that they physically went to. And so they're collecting a, a piece of memorabilia from that game, but they're also getting an experience that a trading card collector or a jersey collector wouldn't be able to get other than if they're going to buy game-use merchandise, game-used uh, jerseys, et cetera, spending millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and so this is a way to democratize that experience, carrying something real home with you. And we're starting to see some signs of optimism across both NBA Top Shot and NFL All Day. Obviously, we've been hit with the same um, momentum shift in NFTs as a category, but my, that's my point. Everything has to be beyond, behind the scenes. These are just digital trading cards that you can play with. Actually, I'll talk about playing in a second. Um, but we had our, our highest ever rookie sale, $145,000 for Victor Wembanyama's one-on-one uh, -on -one rookie card, an absolutely generational talent. We're all, we've also seen every single pack drop across NBA, WNBA sell out over the past six, nine months. Um, the premium drops with an average 5x more demand and supply in NBA. In a WNBA, which actually has our new kind of economy design in a more um, usable way, we've seen much higher supply to demand ratio, 16x more orders placed than packs available. Um, and every single thing that we're selling is reselling on the marketplace for, for higher than we sold it for. Um, and that's, that's the kind of, kind of crypto-native sort of um, uh, indications that start showing uh, some you know, you know, viral traction. But we've got to be careful because the, we, got, we want authentic users and we want an authentic experience. Um, same thing with across the NFL. We had, we've had maybe the most exciting NFL rookie class in, in history, or at least in the past few decades. Um, and it's being reflected in our numbers, 135,000 orders for the first two 
uh, sets of rookie packs, which are about 14,000 14, packs. Um, and, and, but the thing I'm most excited about is that our products now have, and uh, we introduced at the tail end of the last NBA season, a feature called Fast Break, daily gameplay, so you can actually tr play with your stuff now. You can come up to the site every single day and do something that doesn't involve buying and selling. It involves playing, uh, uh, predicting, uh, playing against your friends, with your friends, whatever you'd like. And this season with the NFL is the first season that um, it's going to be from the beginning across both sports, um, daily gameplay or weekly in the case of the of the NFL. And we're seeing huge impact on our numbers. And these are all kind of normal sports fans. But they're normal sports fans that, in their daily sports fan journey, are spending a lot of time and money inside other real money products, um, like sports betting, like fantasy, um, and others, um, and want a way to connect with their friends and their communities in a new way. So the, the average revenue per user, our revenue per user for folks that play fast break um, to the tail end of last season was orders of magnitude higher than our um, than our normal user base, and we're excited about that. So like I said, this season we just introduced Playbook last couple of weeks. Um, uh, someone won, two people won $10,000 actually this last, um, last week, and, um, and, uh, and so you can place picks for free, but you have to have moments in order to participate in the higher, uh, higher tiers. So it's kind of like a free-to-play game that you can play with your moments, rewards collectors for having a broad collection, but it's all an exciting way for people to connect around the things that they love. And the exciting thing that I want to uh, announce that's relevant for the hackers in the room for the hackathon in a couple of days is that eventually all of this will be put on chain and so others can build derivative experiences on top of it as well as calculators, utilities, things that uh, gamers can use to kind of get an edge. But Today, or at least for the hackathon, we're going to open up the public API, and so people can sort of play with the kind of information that is going to be available on chain and the composability and utility that that hopefully engages. And the point that the last speaker made is exactly right. If you build for an existing audience, day one, you have people that come try out your product, maybe provide revenue, but at the very least, provide feedback and an early um, uh, sort of a jump start to your, to your growth cycle. All of this runs on Flow.com, but what I want to call out is that Flow is, as of two weeks ago, um, two, three weeks ago, fully EVM equivalent. And so anything that works on ETH mainnet works out of the box on Flow. And the bridges and interoperability between everything you build on Flow back to Ethereum is much better than it was before. And this wasn't necessarily, um, you know, the, the, the way we built Flow originally, and Dieter can talk about a lot of his technical leadership over the past few years, We've innovated a lot on the user experience, on the scalability, on the complexity of how you can write more interesting smart contracts without uh, being scared of you know, hacks and, and, uh, and vulnerabilities. But the key thing that we've, um, we've done in the last few weeks is built those bridges back to Ethereum. And so in, in a sense, even our own products, NBA Top Shot, et cetera, can benefit from everything that you, everyone in this room can build whether it's DeFi, whether it's um, gaming utilities, and, uh, and, and there's a few exciting things coming out from there as well. And a lot of the things we launch on Flow will also be bridged back to Ethereum, and so you'll have, for example, fungible tokens that represent uh, liquidity pools of NBA top shots at various levels, and they'll be a bridge between Ethereum and Flow, and so you can uh, purchase on Ethereum or on Flow, and people can mark and make back and forth. And that just provides liquidity for folks, so instead of selling each item individually, they can throw them into a liquidity pool. Instead of buying items individually, they can buy bulk, um, resell, repack themselves, et cetera. It opens up new avenues um, compared, to, compared to anything else that's possible in the physical world. Um, so Flow is consumer ready. It's had um, nearly uh, uh, 700 million transactions processed in its life cycle. Um, but like I said, just now, it's become open and available for everybody else to build on. Um, its biggest application is not Dapper Labs. Dapper Labs is a minority of the network in every way, um, and it's completely run fully independently by a foundation um, that, that we can speak to. Um, fully interoperable, that means anything you launch on Flow can actually work, all the assets can work back um, with everything on Ethereum, MetaMask, OpenSea, whatever it might be. And everything that works on Ethereum works on Flow just like an, an, an another L2. The difference between Flow, maybe an, again analogous to the last speaker, and any other generic L2, is we've invested the last four years into that consumer experience. And, and every single builder on Flow is trying to build a consumer product. 
Um, and that audience of normies, in a sense, but also folks that want access to the crypto native benefits that, um, that the blockchain provides, um, that exists on Flow. So really exciting, amazing uh, uh, ecosystem, and uh, I want you to be a part of it. So we're, we're going to be joining the ETH Global Hackathon track. We'll be joining every single ETH Global event um, for the coming future and, and excited to, uh, to be part of the Ethereum ecosystem uh, again. Uh, we started here. We built all of our first products here um, and excited to, uh, to build all the next set of products here. So thank you very much, especially if you've been a collector of CryptoKitties and, uh, or NBA Top Shot. And uh, thanks for having me. Enjoy the conference.